Welcome back, everyone. I'm really excited to be sitting here with Dr. Morgan Levine, who is an assistant professor at Yale. Her research focuses on understanding the science of aging. She uses bioinformatics to quantify the aging process using something called epigenetic aging clocks, which we are going to talk about in, in great detail today. Her research really aims to understand the underlying mechanisms that drive the aging process with the hope of potentially testing interventions, whether they're lifestyle or pharmacologic, that can perturb the aging process. And you know, when I say perturb, I mean maybe slow. So um, she's also a principal investigator at Altos Labs, which is a new biotech company that also aims to understand the underlying mechanisms that drive the aging process, again, with the hope of possibly having interventions that could slow aging. Um, the advantage of epigenetic clocks is, again, you can get a different measure for different tissues or cells in your body. So the blood test, these clinical tests, you'll get one, one measure, one biological age measure out of them. Um, but for the epigenetic clocks, we can measure your skin's age or, you know, if you had a biopsy, you can measure different organs' age. Um, so even though people usually just use them in blood, they have a lot more potential just to compare kind of how different organ systems are aging. The problem with epigenetic data right now is we don't have good kind of time course data. We're not mm -hmm. following people longitudinally. There are very few studies that do this. Um, there are more studies that are starting to, um, but I don't think we've reached the point to say, I can look at someone's epigenetic aging pre-disease state and then see what happens after they've developed some disease. But I would imagine that it would probably kind of snowball and accelerate. And we do know, not looking at epigenetics, that it, once you get a disease, it's actually a shorter time to each subsequent disease. So there does seem to be this kind of accelerating event in aging that occurs. The problem is that the epigenetic data is not super cheap. So, you know, to do that many people that many times, yeah, you have to come up with quite a bit of funding to be able to be, do It that. would be interesting. It would definitely yeah, be no, <laughs> I'm all for this. The more, the more data samples we can get, I think the better we'll be able to figure this all out. Do you think that the epigenetic aging could be a sort of develop, like, mm -hmm. like a program, like a yeah. program that's regulating aging? Like, is that a possibility? I, yeah, I don't think it was a program designed, you know, some people would argue that it is, you know, a program designed to drive aging because um, they think, you know, for species selection, you need things to age and die so that the species can reign. I think it's a developmental program that just doesn't really get turned off and maybe goes a little bit awry as all these other changes start to accumulate in our bodies. Um, but yes, the epigenetic clocks are really tracking something very central to development because most of these changes we can see during development and a lot of the genes that seem to be involved are these developmental genes. Um, we're still, again, not sure what this means or what this program actually is, but it, it, it definitely is tied to development. But people would also argue that aging is very tied to development. Yeah, I think definitely when we measure aging in blood, we have to think you know, what is, you know, probably driving these, these signals that we see. And I, I would guess that epigenetic age acceleration in blood is mostly reflective of inflammation, unless, again, you're developing a clock that's specifically tuned to some other thing. Although inflammation seems so, you know, vast and systemic, it, it affects so many different things. I mean, my, my perspective is not there's a cause of aging, right? And, the, you know, there, it's this thing, and once you fix that, everything else will go away. I mean, so many things go wrong, and your system can change. It can diverge in some... Going back to kind of Mike Snyder saying, even if you bring that down to the molecular level, there's so many different ways that someone's system can kind of change over time, and I don't think it's like you just need to... It's just this one thing that's going to then drive all of aging. Um, yeah, we still don't know exactly what the CPGs that are in these clocks are functionally doing. Um, even though we say, oh, I, I actually said it in the beginning of this talk, when you have methylation, it's repressive. When you don't, is it's active. But it, it seems like it's actually a lot more complicated. Epigenetic age reversal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's a big interest, of course. So this really came out of um, work originally from Shinya Yamanaka, who discovered what we call these Yamanaka factors, which are four transcription factors. We just call them OSKM, um, which, when expressed, you can actually take a somatic, so a, an adult cell, and convert it back into what looks like an embryonic stem cell. So we call these induced pluripotent stem cells. And then you can use those to make a number of different types of cells. But the interesting thing and why aging researchers got really invested in this science is that not only are you making it embryonic-like in terms of its stem cell properties, but the epigenetic clocks are seem to be almost completely reversed. And we've actually shown recently they're not completely reversed, but you can take a skin cell that has an epigenetic age of 40, and do this, it takes, you know, a, a few weeks to do and, and basically get back to an epigenetic age of zero in those cells. And, and, and you keep it at the skin cell? It doesn't lose its identity? No, or? so it loses its identity. Okay, when you, when in, you yeah, so this full, um, this is considered kind of this full epigenetic reprogramming. And then what Juan Carlos Belmonte and others have done is look at this idea of partial reprogramming. So can we push the cell back a little bit, because actually what we find is that this age reversal happens first, prior to the cell losing its identity. So can you do that part without pushing it all the way back, what we consider up or down the landscape, to this, this pluripotent stem cell? So can I just make an old skin cell a young skin cell, but it's still a skin cell? So that's the goal. So to you, what does that mean? Like that you can do that. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think this is the most fascinating thing. Again, I don't know in terms of translation, like actually making this a therapeutic, and I don't even think people were at the point Basic where we're science. speculating. But yeah, I just think it's so amazing. The yeah. questions I have in my mind are, okay, well, you take this, you know, 40-year-old skin cell, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, and let's say you're going to completely reprogram it to a stem cell, and your epigenetic age goes back. Um, but like, what happens to all the damaged mitochondria? Yeah. Are they still there? <laughs> like, what about the pieces of DNA that, you know, like, is that stuff still there? Like, where does it go? I mean, How does it go yeah. away if it does? The exciting thing is actually the mitochondria seems to also be kind of set back to okay. a better functioning state. Oh, really? And yeah, again, it's not clear how all these things are linked to each other. I think the other question, though, is, you know, cells also build up kind of these aggregates and other, you know, nasty kind of byproducts and accumulate what happens to them. I don't think right. we know that. I, I don't think what we see with aging is just random stochastic damage or errors. I think we've always saw, thought of aging as just this accumulation of errors, but it really might just be a program that kind of goes wrong and there's nothing evolutionarily that needs to prevent it from doing that because it doesn't benefit, you know, fitness to prevent that program from going wrong. Um, but the idea that it can be reprogrammed, again, using the operating system kind of analogy that you can just take an you know, operating system that's not doing well and do an update and take it back to this better state. And again, we need to figure out exactly what that means, but right. I, I think it's really exciting. It is, and it's certainly, like, there's no doubt that accumulation of damage does play a role in aging, but mm -hmm. like, Maybe it's not the cause or the only thing. Yeah. Or maybe it's maybe it's just the feed forward loop accelerating it. Who yeah, knows, right? Exactly. I mean, it's it is it's all it's also interesting. Um, I think the other thing I kind of um, you kind of alluded alluded to for for a moment was genetics. And I had a question here because you were saying genetics. It seems as though there's like ten to twenty percent. You mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's not pretty small. Pretty small in terms of epigenetic aging, like yeah. But, e it. but even in terms of lifespan, it it seems to be on par with that. So only a small percentage of yeah. the way you age is controlled by genetics. Now, yeah. this is my caveat, or my question. No, okay. yeah. Unless, <laughs> what if you are a super centenarian yep. or a semi-super centenarian? Like, there's obviously, you're an outlier, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, yeah. that's an outlier. But it exists, and it's thought to be under genetic control, I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so they're probably not just randomly making it to that. So, so for most of us, our aging is going to be less under genetic control. But if you, there are definitely people you might think win the genetic lottery, right? So they're very unique and they have the perfect combination. It's probably not one gene. They just have the perfect combination of different gene variants. And that somehow enables them to live much longer than the rest of us. It seems even despite having bad 
health behaviors. So these super centenarians don't necessarily smoke less or eat better or exercise more than people in the general public, but they're somehow able to overcome that and survive to extreme ages. And they, they probably are more, that's probably more under genetic control. Um, but for most people, unless you have you know, a string of grandparents that all survive to 100 to 110, you're probably not going to be able to rely on your genes.